Okay, what are the topics in electricity and magnetism? Well, when we start electricity and magnetism, um, it's actually, I think, chapter 21. So it's the first chapter in the 20s, so chapter 1. Um, first chapter in electricity and magnetism, we talk about charge, right? Charge, which we call Q or big Q, often doesn't matter at all, but often on the little Q is a small charge and a big Q is a big charge. And then we talk about field and force, right? The force between two charges, um, the electric force, Fe, um, or, yeah, sorry, the electric force between two charges, which is given by Coulomb's law, which is another inverse square law, kq1, q2 over r squared. Now here, remember I, I, um, I had to correct myself on the direction of the gravitational force. The direction is r hat, right? Two like force, uh, sorry, two like charges, a plus charge and plus charge, don't attract like masses do, they repel. So the force is, in, is indeed in the radial direction. And if one charge is negative and one charge is positive, then that gives that ends up, you can factor out that negative and that gives you a negative r hat and that tells you that it's attractive. If both charges are negative, then it's repulsive and a negative times a negative is a positive. Okay, so this is Coulomb's law that gives you the force and the electric field, of course, is the electric force divided by one of the charges. So the field due to charge one um, is the electric force, we take away charge two, divide out charge two. The field due to charge one is what does the charge one do at the position of Q2 if Q2 wasn't there? That's electric field. Um, so these are definitions. So the, the Coulomb's law is a definition for point charges, um, whereas um, the electric field is a more general definition. Um, could be the force of, uh, could be the electric field of a collection of charges on Q2. Uh, sorry, uh, you, you can talk about the force of a collection of charges on Q2 and then divide out Q2 to figure out the electric field of those collections of charges. If you have a collection of charges and you want to find the net force of a collection of charges, right? So let's say I have Q1 and Q2 and Q3, and I want to find what their force what the net force is on a charge, let's say Q4 over here, I think you know, right? It's just the basic. We find the force between these two charges and the force between these two charges and the force between these two charges. And I say between, I drew a arrow, a arrow on both ends, but actually, right, it's, it's going to be a radial force, a radial force, and a radial force. And we have to add those three vectors. So let me go ahead and correct that. That was not really, I was just illustrating something there. But anyway, we, we would want to find those three forces. Um, this is F, whoops, this is F1 on 4, and this is F2 on 4, and this is F3 on 4. And we would have to add up those three vectors in order to find the net force on four, but what if we want to find the field at that point? Once we find the net force on four, whatever that is, it's the sum, whoops, let's just write sum of the individual forces, F sub i, then therefore the electric field due to one, two, and three, the collection of charges is equal to the net, net force on four divided by Q4, and that would be the field. That's what I meant by the fact that the electric field definition is more general. The force definition is for two-point charges. Okay, fields and forces. Um, you should know about drawing electric fields, the fact that um, the electric field, we start with a point charge, or the, the fact, well, yeah, so let's just draw the electric field for a point charge. The electric field for a point charge, let's just start with a positive charge. The electric field looks something like this. Um, and it doesn't really matter how many arrows you draw, but it is symmetric. What's important is to understand that electric fields originate on plus charges and terminate on minus charges. So if I were to put a minus charge over here, these field lines would go, well, I probably didn't draw that terribly well. The field lines would do that and do that and do that, etc field lines start on pluses and ends on minuses. Um, and 
when the field line, the field lines, the density of the field lines has to do or is is relative to the uh, uh, is relative to the uh, size of the field. So as the density gets less, the field gets smaller. All I mean by that is here where the lines are closer together, the field is bigger. Here where the lines are farther apart, the field is smaller. Here where the lines are farther apart, the field is smaller. And most importantly, field lines don't cross. In other words, if I were to trace any one of these field lines, let's say this one, it doesn't cross another field line. Field lines, by definition, never cross. Given the way that we um, create field lines, they couldn't cross. Because um, the field line, the, 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 the field line indicates the direction of the electric field at that point. It does have something to do with the size of the electric field, but in, what's important in particular is the direction of the electric field. So the direction of the electric field at that point is going to be the sum of all the individual, let's say we had a collection of charges, it's going to be the sum of all the individual fields. Um, so uh, the field line is... Um, so. Uh, don't remember what I was going to say about that, but anyway, the field line is the direction is is indicates the direction of the field at that point. So we could draw a bunch of vectors to show the direction of the field. And we uh, we just discussed how you do collections of charges, but how about a a an um, uh, a continuous distribution of charges, right? If we had a continuous distribution of charges, like for instance a charged rod, you would um, take a single piece of that charge rod dq and let's say we want to find the field at point p e at p we could say de at p is k dq over r squared because the force if there was a charge q at p would be k dq times q over r squared um, so and of course it's in the radial direction radial direction so um, we would just say DE, and then we would add up DE all the way down the line. And so it's a question of geometry and figuring out how to add up. Um, so let's see, whoops, let's draw the radius vector. Here's the radius vector, R. Um, so the direction is there. Oh, that's the R hat direction. Um, and we would have to take the... Well, I guess that, that that was really DE is that little, this little red vector. Let me draw it in a different color. Mm -hmm. So DE is pointing in that direction. Um, and we would just have to add up all the DE. So we take a DQ from here and say, oh, that's got a DE in that direction. Um, and we'd have to add up all those vectors. So it's a question of figuring out how to take components um, and add up all the vectors. Not always trivial, but the idea behind finding the field due to a collection of charges is simply to break the charges up into individual point charges, find the field due to an individual point charge, and then add up all the individual contributions to find the net field. But in the end, while we do need to be able to do some of those reasonably straightforward integral problems, in the end, it turns out that we can use Gauss's law sometimes to make our lives a lot easier. So then we move from uh, the field due to a collection of charges to Gauss's law. And in Gauss's law, it says, ooh, it shows us a way to calculate electric fields from collections of charges that don't require us to do um, difficult integrals as long as there's a symmetry in the situation, right? So we can only actually apply Gauss's law to very particular situations. But remember what Gauss's law is. Gauss's law starts with the definition of electric flux. Right? The definition of electric flux is E dot dA. It's the amount of field that passes perpendicularly through an area. All right? So if I've got a certain area like a basketball net or a basketball hoop, that's a sideways basketball hoop, I guess that was a bad example. Um, and I've got an electric field that passes through that hoop. Whoops, I meant to make it just a constant field, but at some angle. Um, the flux through the hoop, we would have to take the components of that field. I'm just going to draw the components in red. The components of that field um, that are perpendicular to the area, uh, perpendicular to the hoop, and multiply that component of the electric field times the area of the loop. That's flux. Um, and what Gauss's law then, what we were able to... Uh, 
us or what Gauss's law is tells us is that the flux through a closed area so a loop is not a closed area but a sphere or a box whoops a sphere or a box is a closed area um, so the flux through a closed area e dot da equals the charge enclosed by the area divided by a constant the permati perm perm permittivity of free space or, or permittivity it depends on if it's free space as in uh, vacuum or if there's a material um, but the flux um, through the net flux through a closed area is due only to the charge enclosed by the area that's what Gauss's law tells us so for example let's do the simple example of Gauss's law which is um, let's go ahead and ask let's use Gauss's law to find the electric field of a point charge. Um, we already know the electric field of a point charge. The electric field of a point charge is KQ over R squared R hat. That's the electric field of a point charge. But let's use, that came from Coulomb's law. We found that from Coulomb's law. Let's now use Gauss's law. So here's a point charge, that's plus Q. In Gauss's law, what we wanna do is we want to uh, say the, the flux through some closed area. Let's choose an area that has the symmetry of the field of a point charge, which is a sphere. So it's just an imaginary sphere. This is called the Gaussian surface. The Gaussian surface is not a real real thing. It's just an imaginary surface. And we're saying, let's, let's look at the electric field through that surface. Now imagine that the electric field is pointing out in all directions. The electric field goes through that surface. Um, and we've chosen the surface so that the electric field is always perpendicular to the surface, right? That's why we chose the Gaussian, a spherical Gaussian surface, because the field due to a point charge has spherical symmetry. Um, and we can use Gauss's law and say, ah, okay, so now for that surface, which is some arbitrary, we've chosen a surface that has an arbitrary radius r, that, um, that we can apply Gauss's law, let's just go ahead and apply this, E dot DA. Uh, forget the right-hand side. Let's just look at what E dot DA looks like. Well, this is the electric field on the surface. This is a surface integral. So we would say, ah, okay, so that is equal to the integral of E DA times the cosine of the angle. What angle? Whoops. I don't need to put a vector sign there because we just got rid of that. Um, e dA times the cosine of the angle. What angle? The dot product that indicates the angle between the electric field and the area. Now, the electric field, for example, at this point, points in the radial direction. The area also, by definition, the area vector is always normal to the surface. So the area vector also points in that direction. So what's the angle between them? The angle between them is zero, right? So where theta is zero, that's why we chose the surface of a sphere because that gives us a, a that makes the math a little bit easier. So this is equal to EDA. We now got rid of the dot product. Okay, E, we've also chosen a situation where the field and again, we do have to know something about the field. We don't, let's pretend we don't know this, but we, we need to know, well, you can look at the symmetry and say that E is constant over that field, over that surface. E is constant over that surface. So since E is a constant, right, because we chose a surface, and think of this in three dimensions, even though it works in two dimensions, we chose a surface so that the distance between the field lines is the same everywhere on the surface, therefore E is a constant, so therefore E can come out of the integral. And so what we're left with is simply the integral of dA, which is the surface area of the sphere. So that gives us E times whatever the surface area of the sphere is, which I think is not 4 thirds, but 4 pi r squared. So the flux through that surface is E times 4 pi r squared. But remember, actually what we're trying to do here is figure out what is E. So now we set it equal to Q and close over epsilon zero. So using Gauss's law, we're going to set, ah, 
we got the left hand side e times 4 pi r squared equals the charge enclosed by the sphere which is just that q divided by epsilon 0. So therefore we can solve for e and say e equals q over 4 pi r squared epsilon 0. And uh, that just gives us the magnitude. The direction is given by the fact that we drew the direction of the field and we know it's radial, but that gives us the magnitude of the field. You say, ah, is that the same as what we had before? What we had before, remember over here, Coulomb's law, kq over r squared is a magnitude. And this is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 r squared. 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. And hopefully I did not trick you here. Right? Don't forget that k, the constant in Coulomb's law, is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. Um, so check the field given by Gauss's law works, gives us the same as the field done by Coulomb's law, which it better, it better. Okay, so I, uh, that's Gauss's law. I want to finish up a review of the chapters and then do an example, so we're almost there. Um, what comes after Gauss's law? is the next chapter is electric potential and just like forces and energy right uh, um, up until now we did uh, we, we were doing coulomb's law which is forces and field which is force per unit charge and electric potential is the energy per unit charge right electric potential is energy per unit charge v electric potential energy per unit charge and it's, it's using energy considerations for electric fields. And so just like with gravitation, the electric potential is equal to the electric potential at a point R uh, away from a charge is equal to KQ over R. Well, I guess I should have said, we should, I, I, I skipped a step here. The potential energy between two charges is going to be KQQ over R. So the potential energy between two charges that are distance r away from each other is kqq over r squared, q1, q2 over r, r, not r squared, r, where potential energy is equal to zero when they're infinitely far apart. We think about, take two charges and hold them far, far apart. They don't feel each other. There is no potential energy due, due to them. But as you bring them closer together, they start to, let's say they're both positive charges, they start to repel. There's the potential energy is getting bigger and bigger and bigger because the closer you bring them, if you let them go, the faster they'll move when they, when they fly apart. Um, so uh, the, the potential energy gets bigger as R gets smaller um, and, uh, and is infinite when they're, when they're in the same place because they can't be in the same place um, and is zero when they're infinitely far, far apart because then they don't feel each other. And then, so that's potential energy, and then we define this quantity potential, which is sort of like field, is field is to forces like potential is to potential energy. So careful, right? U is potential energy, V is potential, not voltage, potential, electric potential. And rem uh, electric field is force per unit charge. Electric potential is energy per unit charge. So um, it's just the same idea as force, force and field. Uh, we just divide out one of the charges and say a single charge has a potential to give energy to another charge if we bring another charge in its vicinity. Really important to keep track of the fact then there is a quantity called potential difference, which is the difference between if I take a charge Q and I move it from point A and I move the same charge, this is just moved to, to point B, that, there's, that it had a potential at A and a potential at B, and the potential difference, delta V, is VB minus VA. That potential difference is what's known as voltage as well, right? So think about a battery in a circuit. It's got, um, it's got two terminals, and there is a potential difference between those two terminals, which is why charges want to move from one terminal to the other terminal. And that potential difference is known as voltage, but we, it, but we can just call it potential difference and never have to call it voltage so we don't have to get confused with the Vs. And the next topic is then capacitance, right? Capacitance. Um, and capacitance is C, which is the amount of charge per potential difference 
that, for example, we talk about parallel plates, right? So parallel plates, if we have two parallel plates that aren't touching and we put charge on one, we, we can put positive charge on one and minus charge, whoops, and minus charge on the other, um, minus charge on the other, um, and those charges will stay because they're attracted to each other. Um, the capacitance is the amount of charge that we can put on those plates, right? They're depending on the, on the physical situation of the plates, we can um, put a certain amount of charge on them. Um, like a bigger plate, we can put more charge on, smaller plate, less charge. Um, and it depends on the, okay, uh, I was gonna, it depends on also the, how close the plates are and what's between the plates, etc. But there's this quantity called capacitance, which is charge per unit potential difference. And then we also do um, circuits. Uh, we really spend more time on, we spend a fair amount of time on circuits in 116 lab, um, but we do circuits really in electronics lab, which is, that stuff is not really covered on this exam. But let's just remind ourselves that it's resistance, current, um, maybe resistivity, which is not density, that's now resistivity. Um, current, I'm trying to think what else. Um, in circuit analysis, uh, voltages and um, parallel circuits and, and parallel and series circuits, understanding how those work, etc. Um, and, and, and yeah, we're not gonna, we're not gonna do circuit problems on the senior exam, but we have a whole class on circuits, so hopefully you took something away from, from that. The last part of the semester is magnetism. It's magnetism, and in magnetism, we first of all understand the idea of magnetic charge or poles, right? The, the North Pole and the South Pole, and the fact that you can't separate them in a, uh, on a magnet. If you cut it in half, you're just gonna still have smaller North Poles and South Poles. Um, and that you can also, um, you have permanent magnets and electromagnets. You can create magnet, magnets by running currents through wires. Um, and we talk about magnetic fields and magnetic forces um, and the relationships between them, such as, for example, um, Biot-Savart law, Biot-Savart, which tells us how to calculate um, a magnetic field B from uh, a collection of charge, or from a, a point charge, it's B, whoops, I'm trying to get this done quickly. So this is something of a summary of magnetism, that Biot-Savart law allows us to calculate magnetic field from moving charges. Remember that stationary charges don't create fields, but moving charges do. Um, therefore, currents create magnetic fields, but stationary charges don't. Ampere's law is magnetic fields from collections of currents, which are really just collections of moving charges. And then the forces on charges and currents in magnetic fields, in external magnetic fields, QV cross B or IL cross B um, is the force on a moving charge. So for example, if I have a charge Q, which is moving at V and it's going through a magnetic field B, it's gonna feel a force equal to QV cross B, feel a force perpendicular to its direction of motion as it moves through that field. Um, and the last thing that we do in magnetism, which we really don't spend enough time talking about, is Faraday's law, which talks about how you can generate, um, ge sorry about that, okay, Faraday's law talks about how you can generate current, you can induce current, you can induce electric fields from changing magnetic fields, which is fantastic because otherwise we wouldn't have iPads and telephones and computers. Um, that you can generate, uh, you can move charges by moving magnetic fields near them, generation of current. So that's Faraday's law. But really in the end, what's fantastic about this whole thing is that we find out that, that uh, if, you if you have a changing magnetic field, it will induce changing electric fields but if you have a changing electric field, it will induce changing magnetic fields. Um, and so therefore, it's this self-perpetuating thing. A changing magnetic field induces changing electric fields, which induces changing magnetic fields, which induces changing electric fields. And it was Maxwell who put all this together, Ampere's law and Gauss's law and a few other things, and said, ah, that explains light. And like, whoa, light? Where'd that come from? That, had nothing, that didn't seem to have anything to do with what we're talking about. But that's what light is. Light is... Uh, changing um, is a it's a changing magnetic and electric field. It's an it's an electromagnetic wave that travels through space. So this all predicts light. Fantastic. 
All right, let's do an example and then we'll be done for the day.